Hey everyone, welcome to episode 11 with Zohab Hussain. But first, I just want to say a really big thank you to all of you. Um, you know, you all check in and listen to this and, you know, we're really grateful for all the feedback. It is really brilliant. We are planning a solo update again soon. So if anybody has any questions, send them over. If anybody's got any feedback, send it over. It'd be great. Thank you very much. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's a good time to do so. It's always a good time to do so. And then you can get the regular updates directly to your device or where you listen to the podcasts. It was really great to catch up with Zoe. We have known each other for a good few years and we always have a good chat. We just thought this time it'd be good to record it. In this episode, we discuss how Zoe got into the fish and chip industry, his involvement with a documentary stroke fly on the wall video frying tonight, and his involvement with dry white young fish fry, of which he was a winner, and current events and current topics. We hope you enjoy. So, thank you for your time today, mate. No worries, anytime. And uh, I know we've been trying to plan this for a while, but uh, a while, yeah. yeah. It is what it is, isn't it? You yeah, know, we're all busy. Everyone works, and uh, you know. But I thought we'd finally get it done. So, uh, so I wanted to get you on board because you do a lot. You do a lot, really, for the trade, and you're you're still quite young. And there's a little bit of an interesting story with everything that you've done. So, um, start us off at the beginning. Like, how long have you been in the trade? Um, how long have I been in the trade? So. My mum and dad have had a shop since 91, mm-hmm. so I've always been involved in, um, well, not involved in, but I've lived yeah. above a fish and chip shop nearly all my life. Mm. Similar to me then. Yeah. Mm. Uh, did you have to walk through the shop to get to the house though? Uh, yeah, I guess we did sometimes. Did you? Yeah, like, you know what, I literally lived next door to the shop. And it makes like, it, it, it stays with you forever, doesn't it? Like walking through a business to get to a house. I always yeah. remembered that. Yeah, they've fixed up the shop since and they've blocked off the door now. So you literally have to go through the house to go to the house. And I get why, because I think my brother got really annoyed with the fact that, you know, he got annoyed yeah. with the fact that it was just constant in and out. And yeah, like, you yeah. can never switch off, can you? Yeah, like, you can yeah. never really switch off. Yeah. And that's that's what our family was, what, what our family is still like at the moment. Um so I I lived above there and I always helped uh, in the business, mm-hmm. bringing buckets of chips um, to the front of the shop from the back. Yeah. And um, I, my mum and dad didn't really get me involved in the front side mm-hmm. of it. So I was always involved in a little bit of the pep. And um, since then, um, it wasn't my actual first job there. Mm. I had a paper round and um, my mum and dad really wanted me to... Um, stay in the business and just help out they didn't want me to have any other job oh really other than they wanted me to focus on my education um so did, did they want you to move on and start a career with something else or was it always to be in the fish and chip industry or no it was no? never to be oh, in the okay. fish and chip oh, industry okay. it was always to uh educate yourself get a degree and go on to something mm. it was never um come back to fish and chips which... in some ways that's the ethnic story though isn't it yeah like you know we we do we do Out, the hard labour. Yeah, and the, your parents will do the hard stuff, and then they want you to then use your brain. Yeah. Yeah, as such. Like, yeah. And the next generation won't have to suffer as much in terms mm. of hard labour. Yeah, it makes sense. And have an easier life. Um, so that's what even, my mum and dad I wanted. Even, I don't even think it's the hard labour. I think they want them to work hard, but not physically hard. Yeah. Yeah, they want them to work mentally hard yeah. and, and succeed, whether it's a accountant, doctor, whatever, yeah. solicitor and so on. It's, the, it's always those jobs. Isn't yeah, it, it is. It's because like, they're the... <laughs> it doesn't involve hard, like, physical <laughs> labour. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's what my mum and dad always wanted. And I remember when I had my first job as a paper round, they hated it. Because my best mate had a paper <laughs> round. And, uh, well, we used to play football together and uh, he stopped playing football because he had a paper round. So... He said, why didn't you get a paper round as well? So I got a paper round and my dad hated it. They really? said, stay at home, we'll pay you double. And it, I was it, like, it's the thought of you working for someone else, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But they didn't want me to work because well, a paper round, it, it wasn't much money, but mm. it was more of me getting up the house and doing <clears> something different. <throat> for you, it was being social. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they just hated it, but I did it anyway. And um, that was my... And then after that, I had a job at um, Ikea at 16. Mm-hmm. And they hated that as well. Oh, really? <laughs> and um, that was, uh, I, I absolutely loved that job because I started when I was, what, 16? How and did you get there? Like, bus or? 
Yeah, I bussed it then. Yeah. Um, I got a bus into Cardiff Central and uh, a bus from Cardiff Central to Cardiff Bay where IKEA is. Mm-hmm. So I had to get two buses there and sometimes we would finish late. IKEA closed at 11. But what was it like working at IKEA? Um, it was it was amazing. Um, I loved it. If, if you asked me when I first started, I thought I had the best life ever. Really? Because it was um, just the whole training experience about working for IKEA and... When IKEA first came to Cardiff, they recruited like a set of people and um, the store wasn't built and they were going through training programs and the person who interviewed me was interviewing for um, the bedroom department. Mm -hmm. But after interviewing me, he really, he wanted me on his team and he worked for the kitchen department. Okay. So um, he then got me on board into his (laughs) department, into kitchens. It wasn't a place for me, so he put me on... um, the tables and chairs section because there's like in the kitchen department there's like tables and chairs and there's selling kitchens Mm -hmm. he wanted me on the team yeah but he didn't want me selling kitchens so um it was uh in terms of ikea for those listening who know about ikea being in kitchens and bedrooms was probably one of the better jobs than Mm. being on the tails or being part of um Uh, really the the warehouse so yeah, it was um, it was a brilliant job, and um, I suppose a lot more training is given for those roles. I'm guessing. Yeah. So well, I got hired before the store actually opened, mm-hmm. and we got um, a select few of us. There was ten of us on the team. We got sent to design school, and we went through kitchen design, kitchen layout, kitchen setups, installation, um, customer service training, um, which was about two three months intense training before the store actually opened. And being part of that training system was just, it was great because we got to actually learn about design and I actually didn't realise how much I liked the design of things mm. um, and really got you thinking about layouts and uh, customer flows. So um, it was it was amazing and being part of a team that was sent away. It was always like we were the special team because we had extra training. I always thought you were special. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dal. <laughs> But it was uh, it was a great experience. I loved I loved being part of that team, and it's amazing how you can get thousands of people to walk through a store every week and go in the same direction. Yeah, well, there's a reason they have hours on the floor now. Mm. Do you ever look down, Star? I just walk in the other <laughs> way. I'll go through the door. I literally run through the place. Hey, right? but it's it's a great place to run through, though. I mean, you can yeah. you can get lost and you can still have a great experience. But it was just the whole process of. IKEA is one of the world's biggest brands mm. and to work for them and understand their philosophies and their customer service experience was at 16 years old being opened up to the that world was amazing I, I loved it it is amazing that their, their attention to customer service like they, they yeah they do really try and help the customer no matter what like yeah. I've seen people take crap in there that's been physically broken you can tell like, yeah. you, you can tell like someone smashed that and they're like oh it's faulty oh, okay sir we'll change that for you and you're yeah. like whoa like, well, uh, the, I, the philosophy behind the customer service is just is second to none. Yeah. They have um, like cer- certain uh, training. Well, we we went through training like every three four months. The whole store, we're talking mm. about four hundred and fifty people wow. going through training programs. And I specifically remember something that I've brought back to my business now is heart training, mm. and that's where you put the customer at the heart of the situation throughout the whole process. Yeah. So whether they're walking around the store, or whether they're buying something, whether they're at the till, the whether they're giving something back as a refund, mm-hmm. the customer is at the heart of the situation throughout the whole process. Yeah. And they're really focused on the customer, and that's why it's evident, that's why they're such a big brand now. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think people probably forget that the customer is at the heart of everything, especially yeah. in our business, that because without customers, we'll... But nothing exactly yeah. and I mean in our industry is a lot of it is repeat business yeah. and if you put the customer at the heart of the business I mean we always say make customers not sales you make yeah. a customer make them feel special they automatically want to come back won't they yeah that's true so what was it like seeing them, them dishing out food there because they was, sell um, a lot of food don't they yeah I mean IKEA food service um, is the fourth largest um, well not brand fourth largest restaurant that serves meals per day wow in the world um, and I got to see that behind the scenes even though I didn't work for IFS <clears throat> which no. was the IKEA food service um, I got to see it like the back of house and how they have controls their systems yeah. how they focus on the customer um, it wasn't necessarily fresh food or great food mm. I mean it's food um, but it was it was great to see that aspect mm. of it even though I lived above a fish and chip shop at that time Yeah. Um, to see another fast food, 
well, I wouldn't say fast food, but another food operator, see how they function, see how they work. Mm. It was a great experience. I loved it. Um, what was the fish and chips like there? I had so many. <laughs> the, you know, the funny thing is, I had so much fish and chips in Ikea because um, they don't serve, obviously, halal meat. So I used to, at that time, live above a fish and chip shop. I used to come outside of a fish and chip shop, go to work in Ikea, have fish and chips in Ikea, <laughs> and then finish my shift and come home. Wow. So it was quite strange. The fish and chips, I mean, is, is, is great for what they do. Yeah. Um, they're do famous they, do, for their meatballs. Do they charge their staff, or oh, is it discounted? Or It's, I mean, the staff got a great deal. They treat their staff amazingly well. Um, I think fish and chips was about two pound. No, it's nothing. Is it? um, it's nothing. I know they do a full. Um, and if you think that most of that menu is cheap anyway, yeah, it's yeah, really yeah. cheap. I mean, the cooked breakfast is a pound. Wow. A cooked breakfast, full plate, is a pound. Wow, that's crazy. And they uh, they give discounts to. Um, it sounds like I'm plugging IKEA now, doesn't it? Well, yeah, anyone would think that you've worked there all your life. Yeah, yeah. but it was. It <laughs> no, but it's great that you've worked somewhere and took away something. Yeah, yeah in my opinion, you know, it was. I mean, IKEA. For me, it was, I always got told, you have to either, to be a good manager, you either have to work for a good manager or a bad manager. Mm. And um, in Ikea, I had a great manager who really had, um, he, f- he had faith in the staff and he really delegated well. And my supervisor was terrible. He was like, um, it was like a Ricky Gervais out of the office. Oh, I love that guy. What do you mean terrible? <laughs> I love that guy. No, but in terms of uh, a manager supervisor, that's the worst person you'd want to work for. That's probably me. <laughs> Good, good point, though. <laughs> but in um, yeah, it really um, it really made me think like this is the kind of manager I want to be, and yeah. look at my supervisor and think this is definitely what I don't want to be like. Mm. Which I guess if I never if I never stepped out of my shop, I would never have known. Yeah, different no, but, well, different yeah, you, management yeah. techniques. That's very very good point. So how did you you went then to university, didn't you? So you, yeah, so I started university and I used to come back, um, work in IKEA on the weekends, mm-hmm. and then after my shift finished, worked in the shop. So it was local university. It was Bristol, so it oh, was okay. about forty five minute drive. Oh, okay. um, when I first started, I kept I stayed in a um, I, I stayed in Cardiff, okay. and then second year I travelled back on weekends and kept my job. I just I didn't want to let go of the job in IKEA because yeah. I loved it so much. Oh, okay. And it was, it was it, again, it was being part of the kitchen team was where everyone wanted to be. Oh, really? And the managers trusted me. I mean, when ambassadors used to come from Sweden, yeah. I was delegated responsibility to show them around the store, and mm. it was a great job for me. So, and you worked there while she was at uni as well? Yeah, I worked there five years, four or five what, years. What yeah. did you do at uni? Um, accounting and multimedia, uh, joint honours. How did you mix them? Um, it doesn't sound like they go side by side. No, I mean, I, I originally wanted to do mathematics. Um, I love maths and yeah. physics, and uh, I originally wanted to do maths. But after one week of doing maths, I realised, look, this is this is too much for me. It's too intense. <clears throat> so uh, let's let's go out of my let's go out of what I want to do and do something that's more mainstream, like accounting. Yeah. And I liked um, visual effects. Um, I liked. Uh, I've always been into uh, computer science, so I kind of thought, let's mix them up. Just trying to think how you would have fused those two careers. Um, it's, I mean, it, when, whenever someone goes to university, you never think that far down no. the line. You just think, look, let, I, I like this. Let's just go yeah, with let's it. Let's go and with the flow. And see what, see what happens. Um, but uh, yeah, I think at that time, I thought I would do something in visual effects. Yeah. Something to do with computers. Um, but I thought, I, let's keep the account in there as a good backup. I'm always, I mean, before I always think of a first choice, I'm always thinking of a... The of safe a, backup. Uh, the say. backup option, yeah. yeah. And accounting is pretty safe, isn't it, really? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great degree to have to fall back on. Yeah, especially as an, a son of an ethnic minority. You, yeah, I mean... You, yeah, that is, that, they would have been very pleased with that, that, that yeah. career choice. Oh, yes, my son's going to be an accountant. Yeah, yeah <laughs> so, I mean, you've got to play a safe, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, it is a safe option. So, so what did you sort of get out of university much? Or, like, did you feel like you did looking back? Or I think I, um, I grew as a person. Mm. Um, I think when you're... Um, when you're in high school and you're doing A-levels and you're at home, it's, you're in a different environment. Yeah. When you're taken away from home and you're, you have to mix with a new bunch of people and it's a new environment, it's not your town, it's, um, it's like real world life experience. <clears throat> That's what I got out of it. Yeah, you have to um, step up. Yeah, plus the degree. <laughs> Can't well, forget the degree. That helps, but, um, yeah. yeah. So whilst you was at uni, you was also involved in like the Welsh Assembly and all that, was it? Um, so when I came, when I finished my degree, I came back and I got a job with uh, my local councillor, who was then um, PA to Rodri Morgan, mm-hmm. um, who was the Welsh First Minister. 
So I got to work in his office um, for a couple of weeks. And I really wanted to... Um, I've always been involved in... I've always liked politics, mm-hmm. not always been involved in it, yeah. but I've always liked politics. And I thought this would be a good, um, good stable job. Um, at that point, I realized, look, I don't want to go into accounting. I don't want to sit behind an office all day mm-hmm. and number crunch. Um, I wanted something to do with maths, but it's not what I want to do. So let's try a different aspect. Um, yeah. And I got given this opportunity and it was uh, brilliant uh, to work in Rodri Morgan's office. So I said yes. And uh, a couple of weeks after working there, I realized, look, let's just, I, I, I could see my mum and dad struggling with mm. the business at the same time as well. And I could see um, that maybe, maybe this might be a better route for me yeah. at this point in time. That makes sense. So then you then came back to the fish and chip shop? So then, yeah, after a brief spell at the Welsh Assembly, I came back to uh, fish and chips um, and um, full-time so in the, fish and chips. The, the prodigal son returns. Yeah. Yeah. It, was, uh, it wasn't like that. I still started, um, even though I'd worked fish and chips as I was in uni when I came back at weekends, I still started because we, um, we had staff there, so I yeah. still started at the bottom. I wasn't the boss then, no, let's just of say. No, not. Well, you, you can't just walk in and expect Yeah, yeah. well... That's not the way our, our <clears throat> business works. We always say um, you always start at the bottom. And yeah. even now when we give um, applications <clears throat> out or hire someone, we always say you're, you're, we, we, yeah. we hire cleaners. Yeah. And we say if you can't clean, then there's no space for you in our business. Mm. And that's, that, that's our starting point. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's where, that's where I started. So what year was that when you got in, back into the... Fa- well, uh, 2009, okay. I think. 2009. So... What was that like coming in and obviously starting at the bottom? Did you need any training? Did you get any training or? Uh, coming back to the business was quite hard. It was in, um, when you're part of, when, when you go to university and all your friends are going off and doing degrees in law, medicine, accounting, and they're going off and doing their qualifications. To come back to a fish and ship shop isn't the best, isn't the best story, mm-hmm. isn't the best At the route. time, yeah, of course. At that yeah. time, yeah. Uh, so it was quite <clears throat> hard for me to take that step. Um, but I saw an opportunity. And did, did you feel like you'd failed a little bit in a, in a personal sense, like at the time? Like, did you feel like, well, what was that? You know, what was the point of all that? Um, a little bit, mm. a little bit, yeah. Like, what was the point in all that if I'm coming back? But then I didn't know at that time that I would be needed in the business. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just one of those people that just gets on with it. Like, yeah. if there's a job, let's just get on with it and crack on. And so, so what, what did you sort of do to sort of like get up to speed? Um, so I went in the business I saw that there was we were failing in a couple of aspects mm-hmm. um, and I entered the Joe White Young Fish Fire of the Year competition mm-hmm. and got knocked out in the first round and um, that's when I really stood back and my, I think my confidence took a bit of a knock mm-hmm. um, and then I thought look let's just list, look at this systematically let's just go go about this in the right way yeah. so I went up to the NFFF for their three day training school <clears throat> and um I'll be honest, I had a blast. I had a great time up there. Um, I thought I knew a lot about fish and chips before I went up there. Who but was doing the training back then? I have no idea. So. It was Mark Drummond, uh, Andrew Crook, uh, Dennis Tate and Arthur Parrington. Oh, right, okay. And, um, the dream team. It, it was the dream team at that time. It was, um, it was, it was, they, were, they were really enthusiastic and it really rubbed off onto the students on the course. Yeah. Um, and... It really opened my eyes. Like they didn't just tell you one way of doing something, mm-hmm. which was what I was taught in my <clears throat> shop. Yeah, they showed you a different, a couple of different ways to do each, um, each section, and they taught you the right way how to use products, um, the right way how to peel, chip, money saving techniques, mm-hmm. the correct frying techniques, um, <clears throat> just all the aspects. I was there for three days. Yeah, so I was involved in the full, the full complete course, and I. I took away a lot of pointers. Yeah. Despite me being involved in the business um, from a young age, I still took away what, what, so much. What was it like coming back and putting some of those ideas back into the business? Like that must have been pretty tricky. Yeah, I mean, it was <clears throat> it was tricky because my mum and dad had only known one way of doing yeah. something. So to implement change, um, especially coming from a from your son, mm. who yeah. isn't the boss, is is I guess from my dad it was hard to take, but. Um, we um, we looked at money saving techniques, and once you don't see them automatically, mm. those come over a period of weeks or months. And once um, 
my dad could see the bottom line increasing, then obviously yeah, he was pretty happy about more that. accepting, yeah. Yeah, I guess he was. But it takes time for that to kick in. <laughs> yeah, it, no, it, course, it, it doesn't yeah. happen overnight. Mm. Yeah, no, of course it doesn't. So you did the training and then you then started to enter the awards. But in 2010, you did, um, what was it called? Frying Tonight, a TV film. What, give us a little bit of backstory about that. Uh, yes, so <clears throat> Frying Tonight happened on... Um, was when when I first started entering into like Young Fish Fry of the Year competition. Yeah. Um, in my first year, I got knocked out, and the second year, I got to the top ten. And at that stage, um, there was an independent filmmaker, um, Dean Beswick, who was looking for a story revolving around one young fire entering the competition. Uh-huh. So he wanted to um, encapsulate the the process of the competition, the story, the judging, the back of house story. Um, and just, uh, just he was really fascinated by that there was a competition that promoted youth and yeah. new techniques and um, um, young people in, in our industry. So he just really wanted to cap- encapsulate that story. So he phoned the NFFF and they said, this was last year's top 10. Um, take so, a pick. Yeah, take a pick. And he phoned a couple of us and I think he finalised me as the story that he wanted to follow. Um, and he started, um, he got permission from NFFF and Joy White and he started just following my story in terms of the questionnaire I was mm-hmm. filling out in round one, the the telephone <clears throat> interview round two and um, the semi-final judging at the shop. Um, and yeah, he just followed me. Uh, How long was he with you for? He was on with me off, for, of course. yeah, he was <clears throat> on and off um, about three years. So it was quite a long time. Um, that he stayed with us but he wasn't there all the time he's based in London and he used yeah. to come up when certain rounds used to happen and just film me as I did each round um, so he was with me for quite a long time um, what was that like? it was like having another member of the family there when, I mean when we were doing some of the um, the judging he would just always be there and we became uh, accustomed to just him being there. He was, I mean, he well, was brilliant. Because he was, he was pretty honest, like even on camera. Like, you know, I remember once I saw, <clears throat> I, I, I did watch it a few weeks ago and I, I saw that, you know, you and your mum were talking and you were like, oh, make tea. He was nervous and he was talking. He was there, like, and it was just like, it was like a fly on the wall sort of thing. Like, yeah. I but mean, you never once looked at the camera and thought, oh, better watch what I say. Like, no, I mean, well, the maybe way he did, but he but didn't he, feel like it. I mean, when he first started filming, he gave us the brief of just forget about me, just focus on what you have to do. Because he realised, look, it's a competition. Yeah. You have to get on with it and let the judges judge and let the candidate talk. And he just wanted to film the moment. So he was pretty quiet. He just tried to stay out of it as much as he could. Your parents are pretty conservative. What were they like? I'm a camera around the house or with a shop constantly. I mean... <laughs> It was. We don't have a huge shop, so it was. We have quite a small shop, so, <laughs> so it was. He a, got in the way. <laughs> no, I'm just saying it was. It, we had a lot of people in the in yeah. the shop while it was happening. Plus, you have the judges there, mm. um, and I'm there, and, and then customers <laughs> and customers. You know, trying to do everything the correct way. Yeah. Um, but they were they were accommodating. They were just. Yeah. They kind of just let it happen as it happened. Um, I mean, in any competition, any judge going into a business, they try and. Um, judge it the best way possible and they were brilliant when the judges were there they just moved around Dean and Dean used to just work around the process and film who was it that came to judge it was Briar it was Richard and was it Kelvin Kelvin and um, and I mean in the first first um, first year it was Douglas Mm. Um, and then the second year they filmed with um, Richard Wardell Briar Wilkinson and Kelvin Lee yeah um, in my final year, they didn't <clears throat> film that round because they had already filmed it, but they yeah. filmed the um, the award ceremony. Um, so yeah, he was with me for a couple of award ceremonies as well, which was, um, I mean, it was great to have him there because he had been part of the, it felt like he was a member of staff or, f- or yeah. part of the family. He'd been in there and my mum and dad never went to the award. So he, um, I think he, uh, he buddied up as an extra emotional support for me, uh, mm. a friend at the awards. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was great. It was a great journey that we had well, you didn't together. know me then properly, and I, I couldn't do it clearly because I, you know, I was busy. So Yeah, as, as you are now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now, now no, but, but you, I mean, in, you know industry people, but um, I never had hey, my moment. I'd, I'd love to have my support. Yeah, 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 I mean, I needed that support mm. with me. and um, Yeah, no, yeah no, I think I completely sense you were young and... You know, whatever you say, 
the possibility of you winning, you want that, you want that there, don't you? You want someone to like say, yeah. pat you on the back and say, well done. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, your parents are quite conservative and, you know, they probably wouldn't have believed in all of that really to some degree, would they? Like these awards, they just think, you know, work hard and you'll be all right sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, my mum my and dad never thought I'd win it. Yeah. Um, um, from the very beginning, we, they, they just said, look, it's never been done. Um, I mean, they, 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 they read the trade magazines as well and it was... Um, I remember sitting down with my dad and just said, "Look, it's it's, <clears throat> it's just it just hasn't been done." By what do you mean hasn't been done? By what? Just someone um, someone from the Asian community yeah. has never won a major award at the finals. Someone from Wales had never won Young Fish Fryer, and I felt as though, look, there's there's a challenge here. What look, do you sort of put that down to? Even since then, there's not been any. If we look at just the Asian, I, aspect I'll tell then, you what I put it down to. My dad never. Um, he wasn't part of the wider industry. Yeah. He didn't know how how things worked, and because our, our shop is quite well, quite cut off, mm. we we work seven days a week. Yeah. We didn't go to any industry events. We didn't. We weren't members of the NFFF then, mm -hmm. and we didn't really reach out. Um, and so when, when you're in a bubble, it's hard to see outside that bubble. Yeah. So in some ways, the bubble that was created by you guys felt like, felt like nobody cared. But actually, the bubble was a bubble because you guys made it a bubble. Yeah, we yeah. made it a bubble. Yeah. It was our fault. But it felt like nobody cared, but nobody was ever invited in that bubble, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. But if we look at just like Asians, if we look at that, for example, or ethnics, why don't you think they do get more involved in these sort of events or awards or whatever? Is it just, is it confidence, do you think? Or, or everyone's just busy being in their bubble? I think it's everyone's busy being in their bubble. It's, it's some, some aspect is um, how the businesses are run. <clears throat> yeah. Because they're run seven days a week and time is, you have to give time to events mm. or reading up about something or joining the NFFF. And it, it's a time element as well. Um, so it's, it is quite hard to see outside the bubble. You, the bubble, you're inside the bubble and it's everything outside the bubble is just unreachable. Yeah. You can't get there. Yeah, and I suppose back then as well, you probably looked through the trade magazines and everyone was white, male and 40 and you just thought, well, maybe that's normal. But that's probably not the case. That's, no that's more, how my it? dad thought. That's not <clears throat> how yeah. I see it. No, no, of course. Yeah. But um, that's why I said back then yeah. to someone like your dad, like, you know, he, would, he wouldn't have seen other Asian operators, for example. Yeah, I mean, we used to read trade magazines. Yeah. There, was, um, there was hardly any uh, mm. Asians in there. But yeah. that's not... That's not the case anymore. Though, that's not, it, that's not the case. But it's... Um, yeah, that's not the case no. anymore. It is changing, I think. And I think... The, that's, I, that's why my dad thought it was unreachable. You, yeah. you can't get there. But obviously I saw an opportunity and... Mm. I and, and also, like you say, you were the first, not only Asian, but the first Welsh person to win Young Fisher, weren't you? You said, was yeah, that right? So, that right? Yeah, 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 that's right. <clears throat> so it was, um, yeah, there was a couple of challenges, a couple of um, firsts that I wanted, a lot yeah. of barriers that I wanted to break. And just being part of this competition was just me thinking, look, let's just break a barrier. Let's just see what happens. Mm. All right, it worked. You've done that. So, you know, you've gone on to do a lot. So if, if people wanted to see... Um, that video it is on what well, was on bbc3 back then wasn't it yeah yeah i think it's still on vimeo and it's on vimeo i've got the link i found the link so oh, okay, I'll, brilliant. I'll, I'll let everyone see it so see how young oh, you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was uh, yeah. it was filmed over a long time it was i mean i'm so glad they filmed it now because it gives me something to look back on well yeah well, it was one of the things that fred said in his podcast when he won what he won there was no videos there was hardly yeah. any photos right you've got a video like so yeah you're probably the first to have like some form of video yeah you know because now it's video is nothing now is it it's just like oh video Ooh. yeah but we then, take it like, for granted yeah, now, yeah. so <clears throat> one thing i found which was quite profound is that when you were doing the video you were really honest and like you know when they were doing your judging you were like well why'd you do this like that well that's how my dad trained me it might not be right but that's how my dad trained me and and how difficult was it balancing being really honest and then going back to work the next day with your dad like well um well, I, I kind of, I mean, when I was in the competition, I excluded my mum and dad, so yeah. I didn't really keep them updated on anything. Yeah. It was really my, I guess this was my bubble. Yeah. I was inside my bubble. Yeah. I think maybe we create a lot of bubbles, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I didn't involve them at any stage. Yeah. And uh, it was just me being honest with the judges. But like, when they still watch the video afterwards and you're like, well, that's how my dad likes it. Like, but you have to be honest in yeah. uh, you. I mean, the product that you sell in your shop, you have to be honest with mm. the product that you sell. You yeah. can't. There's no point lying, is there? Yeah, there is, if you're gonna if you're gonna lie and win, well, it's not a real win, is and it? And ultimately, to some degree, it just so happens that your dad is your boss, and your boss tells you what to do. Fact. So yeah, yeah. So in that award, that competition, you you've got to, you know, it may not be right, 
but the fact is it's not your problem it's actually the fact that your boss tells you to do that yeah I mean yeah. And, and that's fine in the competition yeah, as long course, as you yeah. say look there's a system at our shop yeah. this is the system that we follow and but explain it if it was my shop I'd do it like XYZ if I could yeah, yeah. so it's um, and I think the judges are they were really accepting of the fact that I was telling them maybe two different ways yeah um, of doing like say cutting fish or um, different size chips um, so they re- they were really accepting yeah yeah and I think I think you know if anybody wants to enter Young Fish Fryer I think they should um, watch that video I think I think it's quite good yeah I mean yeah. it goes through uh, a lot of the the processes is a brilliant I didn't um, watch it and think oh, it's 45 minutes of my life I ain't getting back no <laughs> I, I didn't I genuinely didn't I'm not making fun like I watched it and I thought it was alright it was decent like you know yeah. and it was good for our industry because I think like people see into that and yeah. you know because again it's like in the hospitality industry fish and chips probably is their last looked upon so so I like yeah so I just yeah. thought it was good to have and um so then moving on the, the competition oh. has moved on since then yeah, it's got exactly. different rounds yeah. in there and it's uh it's it's much better it's than it harder was as well like for good reason like yeah i mean yeah. i wouldn't say it's harder it covers more aspects so yeah. say it covers um if you get to the later stages it covers marketing it yeah. covers say presentation techniques um but it's a much better competition but <clears> in terms of um where the competition goes if you've won it you get a lot more opportunities yeah so it needs to cover a lot more bases as well makes sense so Obviously, people listening to this may know or may not know that in 2012 you won. Um, you won. Yeah, Carbide, yeah. Young Fish Rather, yeah, just tell them yeah. what you did. Co- correct information. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, and the winners around that time were Raymond Fusco, Dan Harding, Craig Buckley, you, um, Carlin, Lee Foster, Rachel. And that's all within that window of probably like seven or eight years. You know? Yeah. Um, and there's many more that we've forgotten about. And you'll, you'll probably remind us now shortly. What was it like winning? Like, yeah. Well, it was amazing winning. Um, I, well, I'd entered the competition for four years, three years winning. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, three years as entering, entering yeah. and one year winning. Um, so you get to meet a lot of young fires. You become friends. And um, I think I'm quite lucky because the group of friends that I made in the young fires group, we still keep in <clears> touch. <throat> we're, um, we, were, we were a close-knit yeah. uh, group of young fires. And there wasn't really um, a competition element involved in it. Um, yeah, we were just great friends. We had a good time. We used to go to uh, industry events together and triple F balls, chippy chat balls. We had um, so educational trips together. It was nice to have friends. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? That's, that's a valid point because when you're in a shop you're uh, on your own. seven you're on days your own. a week, you're on your own. Yeah, and it was in, in my shop, I'm a leader, I'm a manager. But it gives you an aspect of being a team player. When you go uh, with the Young Fires, you're yeah. more of a team player. I think I, I wasn't really aware of Young Fish Fry when I was running the shop. So as a young kid, like, you know, I started properly. Me and my brother started when we were 16, 17. And like, it was never on our radar. But looking back, you can see how we were just me and him, me and my, bro- me and my brother. Yeah. So, but you were in your bubble. In our bubble. Well, yeah. we had no choice. It was a bubble that we, we didn't know, except for relatives and friends that had fish and chip shots. But, yeah. then, you know, I think, yeah, I wonder if, if more people knew about it. Yeah, I yeah. think it'd just be so great. I think like, so much people, uh, as the winners publicise it more, yeah, that, and the opportunities get larger as they are. And especially with more, more social more media. People. Especially yeah. with more social media, because like now all you've got to do is, if you're in the industry, search fish and chips or Young Fryer or whatever, and it starts to just generate interest, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but it's a lot bigger. I mean, it's a lot easier now to be involved as well with, with mm. the social media, as so you in, said. In year one... You were in your bubble. What made you want to enter? Like, what was that first feeling? Was it to win? Was it to prove yourself? Was it to learn? Because you didn't know you was going to make friends. That was a, a, a good consequence, clearly. But yeah, I mean, um, I, I've I've said this in um, when I do presentations on my winning year. Um, what what drove me to win it is that I always used to read the trade magazines, mm. and uh, there was always a picture every year with Briar on stage with the winner, and. I wanted my picture on stage with Briar and that was my motivation. That was, yeah. that was what drove me. Um, and my presentation is called Picture on the Wall that, mm. I, that I've, I've given. Um, and it was, it was just, I, w- I always go for like the big projects, a big challenge. Yeah. If I think something hasn't <clears throat> been done before, let me try and do it. Yeah. Let's, let's aim for the impossible. If you're going to dream, dream big. Yeah. Um, that's the only way you, you should dream. I so, suppose in any industry, regardless of what it is, if, you, if you're not going to try succeed and be good in it, what's the point? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for this, in our industry, it was, it was the ultimate. Mm. Um, oh, for that age group, of course, yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah. at that time, I was entering Fish and Chip Shop of the Year as well. Oh, okay. And I got to the top five, but I kind of realised, look, I'm going to have to concentrate on the dry mm. white young fish fry of the competition. Otherwise, 
both of them could slip. Yeah. Um, and I've got the rest of my life to try and win fish and chips over the year. Mm. Let's concentrate on, on one at a time. That makes a lot of sense. So what would you say changed over the three years of entering? Um, Anything in between? I mean, I, oh, can't you th- I mean as, you, as you go through the competition, I think anyone who enters the first time and they get <clears throat> knocked out on the first round, they take a bit of a knock-in. But yeah. it's, it's the learning process. If you think... I mean, someone asked me... Um, recently would I have changed anything mm. and the answer is no I wouldn't have changed well, anything because they do not tell me it's a little late now <laughs> no but my <laughs> in terms of my journey yeah look I had I had three years of great PR I had three years of pressing my paper three years of um entering competitions three years of being part of um best practice days I had three years worth of feedback mm-hmm. three years worth of free business tips <clears throat> yeah I mean why would I say no to that <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean and on top of that I had one year's winner mm. so I had that extended as well yeah. so why would why wouldn't you want to be part of um, this, well, this great so competition so I learned loads I mean going through the competition <clears throat> getting feedback going on these uh, day trips these factory visits it it elevates your knowledge so you touched a little bit on the I can't remember if it was earlier on audio or whether we were just when I was setting up that the dry white young fish for our competition has changed over the years. Yeah. What would you say has changed? Like, let's say if I was to enter today, well, I, you know, I couldn't, but if I, I was to, what would be different? What would I notice the difference between when you entered and now? Um, I think the... A, a, a couple of the rounds have changed. So instead okay. of the telephone interview, we now have a, a Skype video interview. Um, and the semi-final day uh, covers a lot more aspects. So we have a marketing um, element in mm-hmm. there, um, which some questions are asked, and um, you're giving your take on certain marketing techniques or a marketing campaign you've started or would like to start. Um, and um, you're now also asked to give a presentation. So your presentation skills yeah. are um, are analysed and. Um, is I think that that element is important because if you're a winner, you're going to be given the opportunity to present at trade shows, at best practice days, at, um, at workshops. So I think it was important to add that element uh, into the judging stage. Mm-hmm. So they're the elements that you would have uh, noticed the the difference between now and when I entered. No, that makes a lot of sense. And and would you say that well, you you don't think it's harder though? But I no, would I, I would argue that with more rounds, it does become a little bit harder, which is good because it, it lifts the, it lifts the um, it, it lifts the, the the quality level. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's harder because if if you go back, you wouldn't say that the winners that won previously wouldn't have won. It just covers <clears> more aspects. Yeah, I suppose it's just different then. Yeah, it's yeah. different. I wouldn't say it's harder. It's just different. Um, but it's different for the for the right reasons. I want to say it's harder. I don't, I don't mean to go back and say that it was easier to win years yeah. ago because you know. But I just mean that you know that you know you throw more into the mix now. You have got social media. You have got marketing. You, yeah. You've got a lot to cover. Whereas, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So whereas years ago, it may have just been, does this person serve great fish and chips within this establishment? Yeah, yeah, and you know, it, it, was, it was a lot more yeah, than that, of course. Yeah. But I'm just saying that in the early, early days, you yeah. know. But but um, but obviously the the quality of entrance has really gone up, hasn't it? Really gone up, yeah. and uh, year on year, as you Again, get your feedback, not to go back and say that, <laughs> you know, what I, mean? I don't want <laughs> yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. But I think that's 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 naturally how it should happen. Yeah, I mean, um, well, that shows and, that what Dry White's goal initially is hopefully working. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I was part of the the group, the group that you talked about. We were <clears throat> we went through the change in the competition. So as I was in there, I guess I saw the um, the competition evolve, and we had the first. Um, it was the workshop that was um, they were before the the semi final stage as we know it now. Mm. Um, was implemented. We have uh, we had a, a day with the top ten, and we had a ready, steady cook session where we were split up into two groups, and it was a, a fun workshop. And that was, that was great to be part of. Was Mark part Drummond of the boss? Mark Drummond was there. He, he, he was I, he the boss? No, he wasn't the mm. boss. <laughs> I just let him down, isn't it? I think my final year um, when he judged me was when he was uh, an official judge. Mm. Um, when when the year I won it, which was twenty twelve. Is he the head judge? Um, so he likes to like, being the boss of everything. I know he likes to think of himself as the head judge, <laughs> but he is uh, he's in a very important part of the competition. He's got yeah. a wealth of knowledge. Mm. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree to disagree. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm really joking. It's like, so then also you met Prince Charles. 
What was that like? Tell us yeah. a little bit about that. How did that come around? Brilliant. Um, so uh, I had a call from the National Federation of Fish Fires mm-hmm. and they were setting up a meeting with His Royal Highness Prince Charles uh, revolving his um, charity, mm-hmm. uh, the International Sustainability Unit. And um, a couple of, it was just a handful of people were going and I was selected very kindly by the NFFF to uh, go with them and give my views on the state of affairs and the best way forward in terms of looking after the sustainability of fish. Um, and it, it all happened quite quickly. I had the phone call one week. Um, I remember working with uh, Carlin on the on the presentation that we had to give at the um, NFFF ball, I think mm-hmm. it was around about that time. Um, and we couldn't tell anyone, so we were working um, in secret. Um, and the following a couple of days we were in Edinburgh giving our giving the presentation to Prince Charles a fantastic experience um, was it a bit surreal or yeah I mean when you when you win a prestigious competition you always know that opportunities are going to come your way but this was in in my eyes it was the best opportunity mm. to to present your set of ideas to um, His Royal Highness Prince Charles and his charity, the International Sustainability Unit, on your ways forward. Mm. You really felt as though um, I, I had a say in um, the future. Yeah. Oh, as it would, I mean, we all do. Yeah. But you got to voice it to someone like that. Well, yeah. Which is pretty and, amazing, isn't it? And a whole charity. And they followed it up. And we, um, I think um, positive change came from so it. He, so he doesn't ring you anymore just to get any details? Or? Only on the weekends. But I'm tired <laughs> after my shift, you know. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> tired after what shift? You don't do anything. <laughs> Work every day. <laughs> So if we, so if, so if, just give me a little breakdown and just for people listening that want to enter Young Fish Fryer, Dry White Young Fish Fryer, what, what would they expect to go through today? Like in the way the awards are today. So just, you know, a quick, don't, don't obviously lord on it too much, but just a very quick step-by-step process. Okay. So if someone wants to enter, the first thing I'd say is go on the Dry White website mm-hmm. um, and sign up. Um, oh, just, if they enter now, it's, when does the competition start from? May or something? Yeah. Or um, so if, if you can sign up any 365 days a year. All right. And when the competition opens, the um, driver will send you an email saying uh, it's open and you can fill in um, round the one, form, yeah. the, the questionnaire. Um, and just every, everything's done online now. So round one is the questionnaire. Um, and then um, different rounds, you have uh, the Skype video round, which is a telephone interview. Um, following that, you have the semi-final day uh, up in Leeds, where they test um, a lot of your skills in different sections: uh, yeah. potato prep, fish cutting, uh, marketing, presentation, frying, um, and that's over the course of two days in Leeds. And the final judging stage is um, judges coming to your workplace, seeing how you work in your workplace, um, and that's uh, it. Used to be a that used to be quite a large stage, but they, they've narrowed it down now, so it's not as uh, intense as it used to be. Yeah. And then uh, from that, uh, top five or six, depending where the cut-off point is, are chosen, and that's the final five or six that okay. get invited to London. So they get invited to London. And then what would... Um, what? I know there's nothing officially expected of a winner, but what would you say that... What would what a, what would a winner do? Like, you know, what, you know... And I know there's nothing formally they have to do X, Y, Z, but what would, what, would, what did you do and what did you think people do today? Like, you know, what, um, what would they expect from it? Yeah, I mean, nothing's um, set in stone, but you have to represent the, the industry. I think... Sorry, I say not set in stone. I think um, attending trade shows, uh-huh. um, workshops... Um, I think now there's... Back in my day, there was just the best practice, but now we have the introduction workshop, the mm-hmm. best practice workshop, trade shows. Um, back in my day, again, they are <laughs> back in my day, yeah, I say, I <laughs> like 34. But what is it now? <laughs> no, it was no, like no. what six, seven years yeah, ago, no, yeah, so no. it was um, no, I, I wasn't given a script. But the great thing was with our group of friends, Dan, Craig, Raymond, um, we knew what the previous winner had done. And, and I suppose you went to the events because you were all going anyway. So, yeah, we were yeah. all going anyway and we, we enjoyed going um, and we um, we just kept in touch. Um, the, we weren't given a script, but we knew what the previous winner had done. And um, I mean, when I went, I knew that uh, I wanted to do something a little bit different. I spoke yeah. with um, uh, a Seafish judge um, straight after I went mm-hmm. and uh, he gave me really good advice and said, uh, just don't open up a shop in your winning year. You use this year... Um, use your eyes and ears understand the industry and 
after after my after my year finished as winner, I just I realized that you know, I did understand the industry a lot yeah. better through. Um, f- f- what well, a funny story. Um, well, not a funny story, but a story that um, every time I went to a trade show or uh, a ball or uh, a function or um, a workshop, um, I used to sit next to someone different. So before then, I used to sit next to the Young Fires. Mm-hmm. But um, in my winning year, I sat next to Henry Colbeck, sat next to Seafish, I sat next to the Entrip. I got an understanding of different views from yeah. the different industries. I only realised this after my year had finished, that it mm. gave me a, an overall perspective of how the industry works. In different areas. In different yeah. areas, yeah. So um, I think being a winner gives you that confidence that, look, you can just... Because before, I was just sitting with the Young Fires. Mm. Um, and again, you're in your own bubble. Yeah. Um, but then I kind of ventured out of the bubble and explored the industry in different ways. So uh, there's, there's no given... Um, I, I wasn't given a, a set criteria that you have no, to do something. Brian right. didn't sit down and say you have to do X, but you sort of went with the flow on your own. And, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the great thing is, is that no matter what you want to do, I had the full support of Dry White, the full support of the NFF, mm-hmm. the full support of Seafish. They was, they were over supportive. They couldn't have supported me better, mm. um, and that was that was brilliant to have. Um, when everyone's saying, "Look, we'll support you no matter what you do and the ideas you bring <clears> to the table," we'll listen to you. It's, I mean, that's the dream scenario. What so, more What more could I have asked for? No, exactly. Uh, so you're pretty grateful of the opportunity. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, it was, it was, it was, I, I think of my winning year as brilliant. I, um, so if we fast forward to today a little bit, which is probably going to become one of my best sayings, I think. Um, <laughs> you, you, um, you were a Fish and Chip Awards Steering Committee member and, yep. and a Frymax Ambassador. Anything else that you sort of do? Um... I chair meetings in uh, Wales for yeah. the NFFF. Oh, I, I want to get onto that in a second, but anything else other than that? Or so, tell us a little bit. Well, about I have, those I have t- work t- commitments outside of fish so and t- chips. Tell us about those two roles: the fish and chip steering committee and uh, the Frymax ambassador. Um, so, the Sea Fish Steering Group Committee. Um, we don't want any secret info. Clearly, just just a little outline <laughs> like what usually happens. Because I think a lot of people probably don't know what happens at the steering committee. So, so it's a group of um, individuals who represent um, the industry in different ways. So you have uh, sponsors of awards. You have Seafish there, the Neoda, there, Neoda, uh, Dry White, um, and past winners, uh-huh. in which I I'm a member. Um, and we sit down and we discuss pretty much everything to do with the National Fish and Chip Awards. So. Um, so me- we, we have a meeting coming up so in that meeting we would analyse the previous awards and we just try and make the awards better for next year so we go through the um, the judging phase we go through the actual award ceremony the presentation the host um, um, the different categories the sponsors mm-hmm. the questions asked in the judging we go through every so you look aspect at all the negatives and the positives try to weigh it up and then nudge it in the right direction yeah I mean if, if changes need to be brought about yeah. we, we discuss those ideas um, and we try and bring about positive change for the next mm-hmm. awards uh, coming up and the next presentations. And and the Frymax ambassadorial role, what's that? So um, the Frymax ambassador role is, we, there's a group of, uh, I think, eight uh, ambassadors uh, across the UK, and we um, help Frymax customers mm-hmm. uh, go to the shops and just see how they're doing with Frymax, if they need help with best practice techniques. Okay. Um, we can step in and um, show them certain techniques and uh, just make sure they're doing, they're doing okay. That's really good. And if they need help with supports of point of sale material, then we can help there and... Just see, seeing that they're okay. Well, I suppose you can never get too much support in this industry, really. So the more help, the better, really. Yeah. So the Welsh regional meetings is something that you do every two, every six months, isn't it? We'll give or uh, take twice. We, have, we have about three meetings a year, oh, so okay, it, February, okay. May, and September, October times. Mm-hmm. Okay. And and give us a little bit of background. What are they about? They are. Um, they were meetings for N um, Triple F members. Um, but we've opened it up now so non-members can attend one meeting and see what the meetings are about and we try and make them as educational as possible Yeah. so we try and get uh, presenters um, coming in and educating members um, and have a Q&A session so um, at our last meeting we had Mark Drummond talk about um, oil um, management Yeah. Um, and we had um, Kelly and Tim from Crispies mm-hmm. talk about their journey to winning um, Fish and Ship Shop of the Year uh, this year's awards and it's uh, it's a great experience to uh, sit and listen to um, 
knowledgeable people within our industry and have a Q and A session and, and really is, is it only N Triple F members that are allowed to come or so it's it's an N Triple F meeting okay. uh, but we open up the meeting so non members can attend one meeting and okay. see the structure of the meeting see how they're um, see what they may learn from it um, but we have a member section as well so that's why we have to close of it course, off to yeah. uh, N Triple F members but any non members can attend one meeting and see if they like uh, what they see and is there any other regions that do it. Yeah, um, I think the Peterborough. Um, yeah, I used to go to those back in the day. Region. Yeah. Um, I think that's. I th- I think they've just closed or they just have very frequent meetings. But the Northwest is uh, meetings uh, regularly. Um, and I think Andrew Crook, um, he was chairman, but he's uh, stepped down because oh, he's yeah. got other commitments now. So, but um, Makes sense. that that one's uh, quite popular. The Northwest. Yeah, that's always been a popular one. That one has actually. Um, but there's nothing in the Midlands, nothing in London. No, uh, um, there's nothing nothing in those regions, but um, I'm sure they're welcome to attend oh, yeah. the, the Wash ones or the Northwest ones, even though it might be a little bit of a drive. But I think Scotland are opening up. That's um, good. Uh, their meetings. Um, mm. they, they might start, start something. They may, it may not be uh, an NFFF meeting, but it's something in the pipeline. Mm, very good. So, quick question. Yeah. Who, well, it might be quick, it might not be. Who has been your biggest influence and why in the industry? Um, for me, it was Briar Wilkinson of Dry Right. Um, again, coming back to my motivation was having a picture with Briar on stage um, and just just having someone to to look after you within the industry yeah. I mean it's uh, important um, they, she's always been I mean she looks after all the young fires um, who uh, who entered the competition and um, I remember sitting and um, not having the guts to sit next to her and talk to her I mean that's how much respect I had for uh, for Baya she's not, she was well known within the industry and everyone loved her um, and having um Having her support was really important to me. Mm, that's um, really good. And she really motivated me to... And I mean, even now, if you ask a lot of the winners, they're still motivated by the the passion she had mm. going into meetings, um, the vision that she had, what her and Calvin started in the memory of their father, Malcolm Lee. It was, an, it was just an inspiration. That's really nice. That is really nice, because I think she did do a lot. I think no one can deny that. Yeah. I mean, some of the conversations I had with her, I mean, we talked about emotional support. I, I didn't um, I didn't have much... Uh, I didn't involve my mum and dad in the competition, so a lot of the emotional support came from Vaya as well in my mm-hmm. journey. Um, I remember speaking to her on numerous occasions and her just saying the right words at the right time Yeah, just meant a lot to me. I mean, sometimes you need that... Um, I think I, I needed it personally. Mm, um, too right. In the, yeah. Not just in competition, I mean, just afterwards. Um, That's like just someone to bounce your thoughts off, your ideas off or something, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. But, you know, everyone's carrying on now, even without Yeah, I, I think we have the passion now. Um, after after Bayer's passed away, a lot of the winners have the passion now, even more so to, mm. to carry on what she started. Yeah. Um, and... Do do what we can for the competition and the young fires in general. So, so you also you also admin or whatever on fish and chip discussion group with Kelly, Leslie, Jody. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about how that came about and you know what 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 happens in the group and you know. Obviously- well, I think you know what happens in the group. Well, People yeah. post in the group. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how did it come about? Um, so it was Mark's uh, group originally, Mark Drummond, mm-hmm. and. Um, then um, he changed the group so that it was more of a discussion group within the industry and yeah. you were uh, an admin as yeah. well in the early days. Chief top dog. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, we, um, we it's, it's, it's not a lot of work, I'll be honest with you. Mm. We just monitor the group and just um, make sure the rules are stuck to and everything's going in the right direction. Yeah. Um, and people post on there, discuss uh, topics within the industry, um, current topics, um, some people post um, like uh, the ones I always like are the ones that are 
we have a range problem. What does this code mean? Yeah. Because if, if, if it wasn't for the group, then where would that person go? Who would he phone? Mm. Obviously, the some of the range engineers weren't picking yeah, up. Usually, it's out of hours, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So it's a great group to have. I mean, helping people in that circumstance is, is important. And that's that's where the beauty of the, the group comes about. Um, and it's, I mean, some people post pictures of fish and chips and say discuss and... Um, just help in general. It's just a bit of fun, isn't it? It, it? Well, it can be a bit of fun, but it can also get a bit heavy, right? It can do, but um, I think if it gets a little bit too heavy, that's where the admins may yeah. have to step in. Yeah. Um, I mean, some some points discussed can be quite controversial. Mm. Um, what do you think the most controversial topic is? Generally, you don't have to go into detail, but what would you say the most? Most controversial topic? <laughs> um, it's probably got to be the intro of that, hasn't it? <laughs> there's, like, so, there's a lot of strong opinions there, isn't there? Um, I think probably previously, yeah. I think um, now that um, the message of the NFFF is so much stronger mm. and they have more of a voice on social media um, and the communication is so much better, I don't think that is the most controversial no. uh, What's topic. What's now? Pocket pies. Um, um, every day there's a post about I mean price. pricing in general um, price bashing yeah. um, pricing yeah. well that's that's the current topic at the moment mm. isn't it uh, price is going up well, yeah, well yeah you know the markets have been tough like whatever we say like they, they, they've been tough everywhere like you know, in my opinion like looking at it from our side of the business you know you know, wheat's gone up, meat's gone up, vegetables have gone up, everything's gone yeah, up. You know? Yeah, But that's not what our, just our industry, it's everywhere. It's everywhere, yeah. yeah. Uh, but again, portion control has been mm. a hot topic and yeah. that's um, packaging's been a hot topic. Portion control, I think, will carry on for the next couple of years. That yeah. is going to be where we... But it's always been bubbling away anyway, hasn't it? It's been fact. bubbling away, but now that everything's risen, you really have to Consider ad- ad- address this issue. Otherwise, it, it's not going away. Like, the prices that have gone up, I don't think they're going to come back down to where they were. No, you may I see you it. may see a drop, but it won't go back to where they were. No, I don't think maybe it's, this uh, is the new norm. Yeah, and we have to adjust to that. And it's great that we're talking about it. This is where the group comes in and discussion about it, and how some people are still reluctant. And then pictures are posted, uh, different scoops are posted, um, portion sizes are discussed. Um, is is great to have. I mean, that's that's where I think. Uh, I think in terms of portion size, we've always been as an industry a little bit too generous, anyway. Uh, you know, and uh, not everybody, different parts of the country, obviously. Yeah. Um, but then I think there's. I think what I'd probably like to see is the N Triple F maybe sort of like start saying, "Here's what we think the portion size sh-. as an advisory note. Here, if you're opening a new shop, maybe here's the three portion sizes you should have." You know, and then obviously price it accordingly to your GP. I think someone needs to probably say, here's maybe a standard portion size. Yeah, but I, th- I think that has been done indirectly. I don't think it's been as directly as yeah. you want it. I, I wonder if, it's not that I want it, I just wonder if it probably has to be a bit more advisory because I think people are probably a little bit confused about it. And, 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 and I think that maybe more emphasis on gross profit, I think, to some degree. Because I think that's something in our industry people seem to struggle with a little bit, I think. And, and for good reason, because not everybody has gone and done an accountancy course or, you know, they've just, yeah. you know, some people have been brought up in the industry and, you know, they've bought a fish and chip shop, but they haven't necessarily had the business training. And I get that as well, because you know, who does, you know, so. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, if you don't know it, it can be hard to yeah get your, um, and understand that concept. But I think as, again, as we discuss it more, people are more aware of it mm. and they start to calculate it. And uh, they've got a new course now for, um um, managing um, profits yeah, within the NFFF. Yeah. Uh, is that a day course, is it? I think it's a day course, yeah. I think that would be a brilliant course to uh, to get on. Mm. Um, if you, if you, for if, me if, or... No, no, no. Oh, you. Well, <laughs> if you don't understand the concept <laughs> yeah, of profit margins, uh, cost saving techniques and where you could be losing money, it's well, for a one-day course, brilliant. Mm. What have you got to lose? Well, there isn't nothing to lose, is there? You, you learn something. Out yeah, of I mean, I'm still learning every day. Mm. Yeah, I get those texts when you're asking me questions. So. <laughs> oh, brilliant. It's <laughs> working then. <laughs> so seeing that you've just told us that you're learning, what would you say, um, you know, I like to ask, not everybody, but whoever I know reads books, and what, what would you say your, you know, what books you'd recommend to others that you've liked? Um, the book, books, um, well, there's one uh, by uh, Lawrence Cunningham called The Essays of Warren Buffett, mm-hmm. um, The Lessons for Investors and Managers that um, is a great read, but it's quite it's quite technical, quite business orientated. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, I, I loved it because it explained business and investing in a way that I didn't know. So I was learning something new. And uh, he was um, understanding the techniques of Warren Buffett mm-hmm. is, 
I mean, for anyone, I mean, as a as a, as a book to read is is a great read. Um, and I love everything to do Warren Buffett and his techniques and the way that he's gone about investing because yeah. it's so against the norm. Mm. Um, and I read I read an I read a story about him that um, he was about to make an investment in um, I can't remember which ice cream company it was or something, and uh, he took his granddaughters to one of their stores yeah. in a shopping mall or as we say center shopping center. And he he made his decision based on did his granddaughters enjoy the ice cream and the experience? Yeah, and it was just such an, a different way of looking at it because well, I'm sure he agreed with everything else first, but he just wanted to confirm it with a real experience. Whereas yeah. a lot of investors probably wouldn't do that. Like, yeah, it depends uh, on again investing technique. That yeah. is one of his techniques, and uh, a lot of his investments uh, in food brands, mm. Coca Cola most notably. Yeah, he always he has. a kind of cook every day he invests in longevity but and he loves yeah and companies that he loves and believes in most isn't it yeah and well he owns like six seven percent of like berkshire hathaway was like six or seven percent of coca-cola i think was it yeah really i think that's quite a lot i think i think it's more than that yeah. but he's always increased his stakeholding in coca-cola and the coca-cola journey was uh quite interesting because he realized just before he bought it that if he if if coca-cola charged 20 cents more mm. for just one can of coke then uh their profits would increase by say 20, 25% mm. because they were already making a certain yeah. amount. So the way that he techniques and the way that he chooses companies to invest in was was really interesting. And he always goes for companies that are undervalued. Oh, really? So that, um, that what Berkshire Hathaway, the, the company that he owns was a textile company that was undervalued. Mm. And he bought it when it was undervalued, knowing how much um, um, property that they yeah. hold and other investments that they hold, because they used to, it's getting quite boring now in technical. No, I did not know that about. I didn't know it was. I, I always wondered where the name came from. It was a textile yeah. company, and uh, he um, he. It was it was undervalued, but they actually the company was a it was making a loss, but they held so much stock in other investments, mm. and it was the stock in other investments that he knew he that he knew on. was more, worth more than what the company is valued at. Mm. I um, think I'd buy that book actually. I think I might order it. Yeah, yeah. it's a it's a great read. Um, but it, again, it's, it's the I've used some of his techniques now because um, I do some stock trading uh, uh, on the stock market, and it's it, to have a technique and have a management style is important, and mm. it really focuses on um, it, company accounts as yeah. well and how to analyze company accounts, dividend payouts, and mm. manufacturing wow. output. Mm. Wow, that's something new, something yeah. I've learned there. Yeah. Well, Zo, I want to say thank you for your time. No worries. It hasn't been a really long one, but I think I like the fact that we kept it, you know, on short point. Short and sweet. Yeah, short and sweet, like me. And <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you for your time, Zoe, and uh, we'll wrap this up. No worries. Thank you, mate. Thanks for having me. Hey, everyone, and that's the end of episode 11 with Zoe Hapusain. I do think he's a good lad, and I give him a lot of credit, actually, because he, he gives back a lot more to the industry than what he's probably ever taken out of it. So well done to him for that. Um, we would really appreciate you telling all your friends about the Sarah's podcast, um, especially if they're in the fish and chip industry, hospitality industry. Um, we have some great, great content coming up soon. So once again, thank you for all your support and share away. Thank you, everyone. Bye.